Hey BookTube, happy Friday. Welcome back to Barter Hordes. My name is Robert, here with a Friday Reads catch-up video. Uh, before I get started, I just want to extend my thoughts and prayers to the good people of Alabama suffering the after effects of Hurricane Dorian. Who knew? Uh, somewhere Orwell is spinning in his grave. Um, so let's talk about the, the books I read. I finished three books this week, almost finished three others that I'll be finishing this weekend, and I've started a couple of others. I usually read three or four at a time, but somehow, uh, because I've tried something new, I've got six on the go right now, which is really bizarre for me, and I'm not sure how well it's gonna work. We'll see. The first one I finished is The Shepherd's Hut by Tim Winton. Uh, this is one of the original 48 books for the Book Two Prize this year. Uh, it did not get past the first round, and it, it was pretty divisive among the judges. Some judges thought it was brilliant. Some judges absolutely hated it. Uh, I actually really enjoyed it. This is my first Tim Winton. He's probably one of Australia's best-known novelists, but I had never read him before, and I know of a couple of his books that have been universally praised. Um, so this is my first experience with him and I'll definitely read more because I really enjoyed The Shepherd's Hut. It is the story of uh, a, a teenager, a young man named Jaxi, who is by his own accounts from a family that is trash. And his mother has died of cancer and left him alone, not by choice, but left him alone with a drunken, physically and verbally abusive father who beats Jaxi pretty severely at times. In fact, at the beginning of the book, Jaxi can barely see out of one of his eyes because his father gives him a sucker punch. Um, Jaxi comes home one evening hoping to avoid his father because he doesn't want another beating and he finds his father dead in the garage. Um, he's been drinking, of course, and it looks like the jack he used, which was kind of a makeshift jack for his car, um, collapsed with him underneath it and it smashed his head. So he's dead. Jaxi knows this is his chance to escape, but he also knows it's going to kind of look like he did it if he runs away. So he's not really sure what to do. So he packs a few things in a hurry and he flees and he decides he's going to head north on foot um, to find his girlfriend, who I, I believe she is a cousin as well. Um, most of the book is his journey north. And along the way, he comes to a very remote shepherd's hut by this dried up salt lake. And he meets someone there, an old priest who has been, I guess marooned is the right word, has been marooned there. And the rest of the book is about Jaxi and this old priest trying to help each other, but stay out of each other's way because there's some distrust between them. Uh, and it's just a it's just a super compelling narrative. Now, Jaxi is foul mouthed. He's racist. He's sexist. He inherits all these qualities from his father, of course. Um, he generally has a good heart but he's very wary of sticking his neck out to help anybody else because of what it might do to him. And so it's, it's an adventure story. There's a lot of suspense towards the end of the book. Uh, and I don't want to say anything more because I don't want to ruin any of the, uh, the narrative drive, but it really picks up in pace towards the end of the book. Um, and I just really, really was impressed. It's told in first person through Jaxi, so you get his his mode of speaking throughout the book, which can be a little bit of a challenge first. You have to figure out what some of the words he's using mean. From the context, it's not that hard, but it's, it's, it's a challenge when you first start off. But I absolutely thought this was terrific. So um, I can see why some people would dislike it, but I also see why some people declare its brilliance. I happen to like it. So I, I, I probably would have voted to pass it along to the next round had I been judging that first round. The second one I finished is a nonfiction book, The Ghosts of Eden Park by Karen Abbott. This is a historical look at the life of George Remus and his wife. Um, 
in the 1920s during bootlegging time, during Prohibition. George Remus quickly became the country's largest bootlegger. Al Capone was one of his clients. Uh, a lot of, lot of government politicians were his clients. Um, but he, he builds an empire and Imogene, his wife, betrays him when he gets sent to prison. He's sent to jail for two years for one charge, then he's transferred to another jail for a third year. And during that three year period, she basically robs him of everything he has, um, starts running around, fooling around with one of the prohibition agents that was originally um, investigating him and, and basically ruins his life. And he doesn't know what to do. He goes crazy and he kills her. Um, and he doesn't apologize for it. He, the second half of the book is his trial uh, where he is representing himself. He has legal counsel, but he's representing himself. He's a former lawyer. He's been disbarred. He's a former lawyer and he's going for the, the defense that we now call um, temporary insanity. And so the second half of the book is the account of the trial. Now this book is being marketed as one that you'll like if you like Eric Larson's books, but this one should have been a book I absolutely loved. But in the end, I really was disappointed with the writing. The narrative just gets so disjointed and there's so many tangents and so many things that really don't drive the story forward that as a narrative, it's kind of a, a dismal read. The second half especially, I just, uh, I was almost hate reading the last quarter of the book. Um, I think if you're interested in legal procedures, you might enjoy this book more than I did. Um, she spends, an, Abbott spends an awful lot of time talking about the legal shenanigans going on in the court that don't matter. At that point, most readers just want to know what did the jury find? Was he guilty or not guilty? And so it's one of those books that should have ticked all the right boxes for me, but just didn't work in the long run. I was really disappointed in this one. The third one that I finished is uh, a historical novel, The Age of Light by Whitney Scherer. Uh, it is about a young woman, Lee Miller, who in 1929 decides to leave the United States. She's been working as a very successful fashion model. She leaves the United States to go to Paris to become a photographer. She wants to be on the other side of the camera. And this is all based on an actual person and several actual people, um, in fact. And she meets a surrealist artist there who's also a famous photographer, Man Ray, and she wants to become his student. He doesn't take students though. He wants her to model for him. And ultimately he agrees to let her be his assistant, to work in his studio with him, and she can learn as she goes and then start taking her own pictures. And so she does that. And of course, in the course of that, they become romantically involved. It's, a, it's an interesting story, but interwoven within that story of her becoming a photographer is some sections of her years later during World War II when she actually becomes a war correspondent and is shattered by the experience, what she sees, what she records. And then there's a frame to the story. The beginning and the end of the story are in the 1970s, um, where she's trying to figure out what to do with herself. She feels like she's just let everything go. I didn't really see the point of, first of all, I like the book, but I didn't see the point of the World War II sections. They were very brief and didn't add a whole lot to the main story of her becoming a photographer, which I think is what the really, real story of the book is. And the 1974 frame around it didn't seem to make any sense to me at all, other than it showed how far she had declined. I suspect that Scherer, knowing the actual history of Lee Miller, felt compelled to put it in the book because it happened. But I don't think it adds to her novel as much as if she had just focused on the story in the 1920s and 1930s of Lee and Man Ray uh, and Lee's growth as an artist and not just the muse for somebody else's art. Um, 
It's a debut novel, so I'm looking forward to seeing what else she writes. Uh, the writing style itself is fine. I just thought the structural uh, problems of adding those World War II timelines and the 1974 frame didn't really add much to the general narrative. But it was, it was a decent read. I'm kind of on the fence about whether I, I liked it or not. Okay, those are the three I finished. The three that I will probably finish this weekend, or were definitely finished this weekend. Uh, the first one is The Forgotten Hours by Katrin Schumann. This is also a debut novel. This is the story of a teenage girl uh, and her parents who go up to a lake, a lake house, every summer. It's their standard summer. And her best friend lives in the nearby town. She is what we would call a townie. Um, and they become inseparable friends until one summer, a boy kind of comes between them briefly. And then on the last night of that summer, they all kind of fall asleep watching a movie or they're watching a movie. And then a few weeks later, um, the girl's friend, Lulu, has claimed that um, her father has slept with her, has had sex with her, which is statutory rape. She was only 14 or 15 at the time. And so he's arrested and goes to trial and is put away for six years. The book really picks up when he's about to get out of prison and his daughter is torn between her loyalty to her father because she doesn't believe he raped her friend and the story that starts to come out when she goes back up to the lake to get the lake house ready for her father to stay in while he gets back on his feet after being in prison for six years. She starts to hear more and more details. She goes and reads, reads the court transcript and she starts to question what's right. And so a lot of the book is trying, her trying to figure out what's going on um, historically with her father now with her father that he's getting out and she's also trying to figure out her own relationship with um, an Israeli artist who's significantly older than she is. So there's a lot going on in this book. It's really well done. Um, it drags a little bit in places but for the most part it's been a really compelling read as she tries to figure out what's going on with her father and with her best friend and what really happened on that night six years ago. So that's The Forgotten Hours by Katrin Schumann. The other one that I'll probably finish tonight is the second in the Inspector Gamache series by Louise Penny. If you've followed my channel for any time at all, you know I really don't read mysteries or thrillers very often. I, I generally enjoy them to a degree when I do read them. I just am not immediately attracted to them, and so I don't often pick them up. But Sarah at Hardcover Hearts talked about Louise Penny being brilliant. Ann Bogle on the podcast, What Should I Read Next, talks about Louise Penny all the time. So I thought, what the heck, I'll give the first one a try. And I liked it okay, and it got better as the novel went on. And so I picked up the second one, A Fatal Grace is the second one. And I'm nearly finished with that. And the thing that I noticed right away, the, the first night I started reading this, is Louise Penny has a wicked sharp sense of humor. And her one-liners, her jabs that the characters take at each other um, are just absolutely a riot. I found myself literally laughing out loud several times, and that doesn't happen too often when I'm reading. So I'm almost done with that. We'll see how that goes. I'm gonna probably try to, there, there must be a dozen of the books in this series. I'll probably try to read one a month or so for a while. And then the third one that I'm nearly finished with is my current nonfiction read, and that is The Death in the Rainforest by Don Kulik. Now, the title is a little bit of clickbait. There is a death in the rainforest as part of one of his stories there, but the bigger death in the rainforest that he's writing about is the death of a language that's only spoken in a single village, and the villagers have started going away from it to a bigger language that they see as the white man's language. It's not, it's not a European language, but it's kind of a pidgin version of European language. And he is an anthropologist and he's there studying how a language can die. So the title really refers to the death of the language, although there is also a death in the rainforest. One person does get shot. 
And I'll finish that sometime this weekend. I'm really enjoying that. Some of the linguistic stuff I'm skimming over because I'm not that interested in the different formations of the language, but his, his tales and stories of his time in this village are pretty interesting. And then I'm currently reading The Farm by Joanne Ramos. Uh, that's a 2019 new release. A lot of people have talked about it already on BookTube. It's the story of a surrogacy farm for extremely rich clients. Um, the women who are paid to be hosts come to this farm in New York. Um, they, are, they are there from the moment they sign the contract, usually after the pregnancy has become viable till the time they deliver. They're closely monitored, they're pampered, they're taken care of. It sounds like a spa, but they're also giving away all their autonomy and their freedom until the contract has run its course. And it's supposed to be somewhat of a dystopian book. Um, and I've read about two thirds of it and I'm not sure it's really getting to that level. Um, some of the things that the hosts are complaining about are not that really awful and, and they knew about it going in. I, I was expecting this to be much more Orwellian and maybe it's gonna get there in the last third, maybe it's not. This book has not received the best reviews on BookTube and so I'm not expecting it to salvage itself as the next great dystopian novel, but it's been interesting. I, I have been compelled to keep reading at a fairly quick pace. So the writing is decent enough that I've enjoyed it. I just don't see it as being the dystopian masterpiece that I think it was marketed as. And then I'm reading two books, which is why my currently reading pile is six books instead of four. But I'm reading two books that are kind of long, longer term projects. I saw, I believe it was on a TBR on Ange's channel, um, The Little History, A Little History of Literature by John Sutherland. And I had never read any of the books in a little whatever series. Apparently there are quite a few of them. Um, and even though I don't teach anymore, I still am drawn to books about literature that would have been helpful for students. And so I'm reading this one short chapter a day. Um, the chapters are anywhere from three to six or seven pages. And it's, it's pretty good. It's, it's generalized and vague enough that if you've studied literature in school, you're probably not gonna learn anything new. But I think it would be a decent guide to somebody who wants to look at literature. I'd put it on the same shelf with, with how, to read a uh, how to Read Literature Like a Professor by Thomas C. Foster. It's that kind of book. Um, and I'm enjoying it. And then the last one is supposedly the masterpiece of all masterpieces of science fiction literature, and that's Dune by Frank Herbert. I've never read it. Um, and I decided to download it on audio and listen to it while I'm walking the dog. I've been listening to podcasts while I walk the dog, but I thought I could get another book in this way. And so I started listening to Dune and I'm probably two hours in, it's like 24 hours long. It's a very long book, very long podcast. And I have to say that it's not for me. Um, maybe it gets better, but the first two hours have just been a massive info dump. Uh, and I just, I just am not engaged with it at all, but I'm doing it in such short stints that it's okay. And so I'm gonna stay with it at least for a while. Um, I Scout gets four little walks a day. Two of them are short just to get her outside to pee and get my mail. And then she goes for two long walks a day. And so I'm listening to it on the two longer walks uh, of the day. So I'm, I'm, I'm listening to maybe 45 minutes to an hour a day. Uh, it'll probably take me a month or so to finish the book if I keep with it. I'm not sure I will, but you know, I, I've already paid for it. The audiobook's mine, I might as well finish it. Um, and that's what I've been reading. Uh, there's no English Premier League football this weekend. Unfortunately, it's an international weekend, and so all the national teams are, are facing off against each other. And college football has started, so I'm cautiously interested in that. I'm not going whole hog on that yet. Um, last year I had all three of my college teams ended up ranked at the end of the season. Uh, Penn State, Texas Tech, and uh, the University of Kentucky. I didn't go to the University of Kentucky, but I did teach there. Um, this year Penn State's the only one that's ranked. 
uh, but they're ranked 15th, so they're not expected to be world beaters this year. So it's interesting to watch, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, but EPL comes back again next week, so I'll be interested to watch that. Hope you have a great weekend. Dorian has passed my part of the state of North Carolina by. It's still on the coast and causing tremendous damage with, with a lot of tornadoes, unfortunately. Um, but it's, it's mostly gone now. Here we have some sun today. It's a little bit cloudy, but we're not expecting any rain from the storm anymore today. We had our, our windy section and our rainy section yesterday afternoon and into the evening, but it never got severe here at all. So there was no, there was no risk of flooding or tree damage or things like that. We're far enough inland where we were escaped any kind of a direct hit. I hope you're well, hope you're safe, hope you're having a good reading weekend or whatever you're planning for the weekend, and I'll talk to you again next week. Bye, everybody.